Thank you very much, uh, and good evening. This is a very pleasant assignment uh, for me. From 1985, when Melissa Block came to work at NPR, fresh from her Fulbright, uh, until 2018, when I retired, uh, we were colleagues for all those years. Uh, for 12 of those years, we shared a studio. We co-hosted uh, NPR's All Things Considered. Uh, as a booker for that program, as a producer, and later as senior producer, which is the fancy bureaucratic title for the person who actually gets the program on the air every day, uh, Melissa, in her remarkably accomplished reporting career as well, during, before, and after her stint as host of All Things Considered, Melissa has epitomized everything that is best about NPR. Uh, she's smart and always well prepared. Uh, when interviewing people, she is a very polite, very probing, and extremely persistent questioner. Uh, no theatrics, but no evasive answers go unchallenged either. Her reporting has won just about every award that fine broadcast journalism can win. She is the consummate breaking news reporter from Ground Zero right after 9-11 or from Virginia Tech where she headed from a completely different assignment as soon as she learned uh, that there'd been a mass shooting or during the Sichuan earthquake uh, in China in 2008. Uh, we were in Chengdu in force, all things considered wise, uh, to produce a week of programming about life in a Chinese city. In the city of Chengdu, there was an earthquake that measured 7.9. Uh, in the city, the quake shook buildings and toppled bookshelves, uh, but it did a lot deadlier damage 20 or 30 miles away, and we headed off in teams uh, in the direction of the epicenter. At a collapsed school building, Melissa spent the entire night with the parents of a little boy who was missing in the rubble of that collapsed building. Listeners heard them live through the worst night of their lives, uh, it was some of the best reporting ever on NPR, the kind of reporting that finds real lives in the death tolls and the casualty statistics, statistics of a horrible natural disaster. This is her gift. Uh, it's a combination of a writer's eye, a radio producer's ear, a reporter's refusal to walk away from a story, and a very deep sense of compassion. Uh, none of this is to say that uh, she is all Miss Gloom and Doom. Uh, Melissa loves covering the Olympics, summer and winter. If there were fall and spring Olympic games, she'd probably cover those too. Uh, and women's soccer. Uh, I will leave aside uh, what I find to be our inexplicable love of country music, uh, but <laughs> which has accounted for many stories on, on NPR. Uh, but I cannot ignore, especially this week, her special relationship with the game of baseball. Uh, when Melissa was a reporter in New York, she once called asking for suggestions for a feature story, and I told her about the great, now late, Bob Shepard. Uh, Bob Shepard, if you don't know, was the uh, public address announcer at Yankee Stadium. Uh, he was a moonlighting speech professor who for decades uh, would introduce the players with elocution uh, that suggested the time of FDR, uh, now batting number two, shortstop, Derek Jeter, number two. <laughs> Melissa was a complete stranger to the game of baseball. She had never been to a baseball game. And her introduction to the game was a September game in which the Yankees won their division, which was a rarity at that time. It was a big breakthrough. 60,000 hysterically happy New Yorkers uh, were in the seats. And in a six by six foot booth overlooking uh, the field, the dispassionate announcements emerged from Bob Shepard uh, and in between those announcements, as, as Melissa described him, he would turn the pages and continue reading on that day, the complete Oscar Wilde. Uh, not only did Melissa produce a hilarious and I believe the definitive radio profile of Bob Shepard, she left the ballpark a freshly minted obsessive Yankee fan. Uh, I'd like to think sometimes that but for that assignment, maybe she wouldn't have fallen for a sports writer, her husband, Stefan Fatsis. So I, I take remarkable responsibility for Stefan, Chloe, the whole, the whole family. In any case, <laughs> uh, in any case, congratulations uh, to the association for its wisdom in choosing such a desiring honoree. Uh, and I will uh, introduce special correspondent, Melissa Block. <laughs> Melissa Block. Thank you. 
I had uh, 12 years to try to convince Robert Siegel of the virtues of country music, and, and I consider it a lifelong failure that that did not succeed. Um, and it is absolutely true, I, I think, Robert, that the secret of my marriage and the fact that I have this incredible daughter, I think is wholly attributed to the fact that you turned me into a Yankee fan. And let's just notice that once I started covering the Yankees, they started winning World Series <laughs> for many years. So something was going on. Um, thank you so much. I'm so grateful to the Fulbright Association for this honor, to John Bader and to Cynthia Baldwin, who nominated me for this award. And I am so proud to be in the company of all of those who have received this award in years past and to be honored today with the incredible architect, James Polshek, and with President Grabar Kitarovich. So thank you all so much for that. Um, and also, I should just say thank you to Robert for letting me once more follow in your footsteps. I've been doing it for the last 35 years, and um, what an honor it was to share the studio with you for, for 12 of those years. And let's get the band back together. What do you say? Um, there is a... <laughs> Although I think his wife Jane would be saying, no, no, retirement is a good thing. So um, th those, those words, lifetime achievement, I have to say, uh, inspire a, a fairly substantial dose of introspection, especially if you think, as I do, that maybe your white life's work has a few more chapters still to be filled in, and that there is still time for some more gratifying and satisfying work, maybe a few more achievements still to come. But this award did give me the occasion to head to my basement and rummage through an archive of documents from my Fulbright year, 1983-84, I am a compulsive saver, as my husband and daughter will tell you. So there was plenty down there in the, in the dust of the basement to sift through and dust off and to jog my memory. For starters, I found the Fulbright application that my 20-year-old self typed up on my trusty Smith Corona sitting in my dorm room on a fall day in Cambridge, Massachusetts, dated October 12, 1982. Uh, in my application, I proposed a course of study at the University of Geneva that would focus on contemporary French literature and modern literary theory, which in fact I did study. Uh, I said I was drawn to Switzerland's cultural diversity and that I hoped that the grant would help me choose between a career in academia or law. Or maybe at that point I thought working for a newspaper or magazine, radio was by no means on my radar at that moment. Um, I talked in the application about writing and writers as being crucial to promoting understanding between people and cultures. And I wrote this, my long range goal is to be able to provide that same kind of powerful, rousing insight to an audience of my own. There's nothing like reading the, the musings of a, of a 20 year old to make your eyes roll back in your head. But, more intriguing to me than my own application, successful as it was, and I had not remembered this at all, that along with a lot of notarized documents with official looking stamps, because as many of you in this room probably know, the Swiss are all about stamping documents, they love that, and I spent a lot of my time in Geneva, as I recall, waiting in line to get documents stamped. Um, but in that packet, I found a Welcome to Switzerland pamphlet that if I had looked at it a little more closely, might have given me pause. It was titled, Getting to Know the Swiss. And it read ominously, it is not always easy to meet people here, as we rarely start a conversation with strangers, not just foreigners, but even other Swiss. <laughs> there is no formula we can give you. It's just a question of meeting the right people. But give it a try, and you won't regret it. Exclamation point. <laughs> and on that same document, on the next page, they helpfully included these words of advice from a former American exchange student in Switzerland. Depression he or she wrote, seemed to plague many of the American exchange students. It appears to hit everyone as an emotional year of hells and valleys, and they actually spelled it hells. <laughs> they urged, try to take positive action against such occurrences. Well, positive action in my case involved a lot of mind-opening journeys that year through Switzerland and into France and Italy and England and Greece. It meant seizing the opportunity to dive not just into French literature, but also into Shakespeare and Nabokov and the Russian language. It definitely meant extensive experimentation with all things cheese, gallons of fondue and raclette. It was a year that left me speaking French forever saddled with what I am told as a little Genevan accent, un petit accent genevois. And that Fulbright year certainly inspired a lifelong thirst for travel, which also meant exploring and observing and delighting in difference. And that, I think, is the main lesson, the abiding lesson of my Fulbright year, how immersing yourself in another culture trains you to notice things, to be a careful observer of detail. Nothing is familiar. 
you're listening super closely because you're communicating in another language, you're watching people, how they dress, the gestures they make, how they stand and move and interact, the smells, the tastes, all of it is new and notable. And my letters home that year, my parents saved them and I was reading them yesterday, the letters are all packed with detail, no detail too small. I was drinking it all in and writing it down. And as I think about it now, that lesson ultimately shaped how I approach my work as a journalist, how I try to observe and listen above all and convey an understanding of people and cultures that may be quite different from our own. When I tell stories on the radio, I am hoping to get you to see life from someone else's perspective. If I do my job right, you will be transported somewhere, you will listen actively, and you will understand someone's life just a little bit more. What drives them or maybe terrifies them, why they live where they live, what they're passionate about, what troubles them, or what gives them joy. And here is why I think this is especially important right now, because we are, of course, living in a time when everything and everyone seems polarized, where those in my profession in particular are routinely attacked and reviled. It's a time when the other, the outsider, is seen as a threat, not a treasure, something to be feared, not welcomed, and where differences are ridiculed and magnified and distorted, not celebrated. And notably, we are living in a moment where just this past week, the President of the United States referred to those of his own party who disagree with him as human scum. I went to the library the other day when I was thinking about this night and what I could possibly have to say and thinking about this award, and I thought I would try to find a book that I had read, I think, back in high school, uh, a book written by the senator whose name is on this award and who created the fellowship program that gave me such an incredible opportunity more than 35 years ago. It is the book, The Arrogance of Power, written in 1966 by J. William Fulbright. And I was struck, it's pretty heavy reading, but I was struck by this section in particular as I think about where we are now and how our discourse is being shaped. It's a chapter where Fulbright is writing about citizenship and protest and about dissent, which he called an act of faith in a democracy. And he wrote this. To criticize one's country is to do it a service and pay it a compliment. It is a service because it may spur the country to do better than it is doing. It is a compliment because it evidences a belief that the country can do better than it is doing. Criticism, he wrote, is more than a right it is an act of patriotism. And later in that same chapter, Senator Fulbright expanded on that idea. He wrote this, there are times in public life as in private life when one must protest, not solely or even primarily because one's protest will be politic or materially productive, but because one's sense of decency is offended, because one is fed up with political craft and public images or simply because something goes against the grain. I will leave you with that thought, which was expressed so plainly by Senator Fulbright more than 50 years ago, and say again, thank you so much for this tremendous honor. Thank you to the people at NPR who have supported me for so long. Some of them are here with us today. And here is to all of those who dare to speak up. Thank you. Thank you.